Hello runners and welcome back for the last course strategy session for this Friday, November 5th of the TCS, the 2021 TCS New York City Marathon. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to take you along the ride as we cover these 26.2 miles, give you some tips and tricks, inside information, making sure you're safe. As uh, I am here with Coach Roberto, uh, last time we were here, we had a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll have just as much fun, but try to keep ourselves a bit more composed. Thank you so much for joining us, Roberto. How's it going today? Yeah, yeah, it's going really well. Uh, we just wrapped up the opening ceremony. So if you were watching that on Facebook Live, it was a fantastic show. I look forward to watching that again. But yeah, we're one day and so many hours away from um, Sunday, the 2021 TCS New York City Marathon. So I could definitely feel the atmosphere in the air, the energy, the runners from around the world starting to gather. I saw the whole Argentinian contingent today. So it's, you know, it's definitely it's a marathon season where you start to see different bodies just running around the park. So yeah, super stoked to be here. Yeah, super stoked. The expo is off and running, runners getting their bibs, asking tons of questions. You get that nervous energy. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to supply you with some information, some tips to uh, put your mind at ease as you head into these final few hours. Uh, but as we get started again, this is, you know, 2021 is a different year than we were last time in 2019. We do have some new safety precautions that we want to go through with you. So, Roberto, talk us through some of the different safety that uh, the runners will be looking at as we get ready here. Yeah, certainly. So, um, today is Friday, tomorrow is Saturday. If you haven't picked up your bib, you'll be picking that up at the Jacob Javits Center at the Expo. So, in order to get in there, you need to show proof of vaccine or vaccination. Uh, you can do that with your card or an app. Um, or um, if you don't have that, but you have a proof of a negative COVID test, you can pick it up tomorrow um, just outside of the Jacob Javits Center, tomorrow being Saturday. Um, we're also enforcing face covering. Um, we'll go to the next slide in a minute, but um, so face covering, meaning wearing masks, you need to wear that essentially everywhere you're going to be going, as you can see on the screen there, Expo Pavilion, Run Center, Bag Check, etc. The only time you don't need to wear it is once the race commences, but we are telling folks, or at least pleading with them, that when you start the race and you remove your face mask, please don't toss it on the ground because you may literally see it fall on the ground, but being that we start on the Verrazano's Bridge, either a runner could kick it or the wind could pick it up and it could end out there on the East River, so we're trying to avoid polluting the river. So hold on to it if you want to discard it. Feel free to discard it once we get into Brooklyn um, on mile three. And without jumping ahead too much, if you do that uh, or you have your own and you happen to lose it, don't worry. When you cross the finish line, um, our partners or hospitals for special surgery will um, have one in that recovery bag that you'll get. So those are some of the touch points where we're, we've included, uh, added more corrals, uh, more waves to, again, kind of lengthen the, the starting process and, and less, lessen the population density, runner density. And instead of from years past having 50, 53,000 runners, this year we're going to have around 33 or 35,000 runners. Definitely. And use a good word. Talk about avoid. And I think that's a word that we're going to definitely touch on here in the first segment. That's very important, runners, when you are out there. Um, because you do want to avoid what we call the race before the race. And what that means is that you want to have all of your details dialed in. Tonight you should be finalizing those plans. If you're not having tomorrow, you should be working on making sure you have all of your information ready to go. Your meetup point uh, after the race has been set with your loved ones. You have your runner, uh, all your race gear out. You have your bib affixed to whatever you're going to be wearing closest to your body. Make sure you know where your transportation is, what time you want to be there. That way you can wake up on Sunday morning, all that is dialed in because you want to avoid that race before the race. You do not want to be wasting that valuable energy that you have worked so hard to harness in this last part of your taper and all of your training to get ready. Because again, you want to be out there, you want to have a good time. There's a lot of runners out there. The excitement's already there. You don't want to be rushing around, making sure you catch that. Did you forget this? Do you have that? Make sure your phone is charged if you're doing that, if you're bringing a charger with you. Again, all the little things, if you have the checklist, get those things checked off because you know, a lot of people are heading out your way. You want to make it very easy for yourself. Uh, Roberto, what's another thing you want the runners to avoid or don't do? Um, well, nothing new on race day. You know, we have several different mantras. Avoid the race before the race. Nothing new on race is another one. So, you know, uh, today's day two of the expo. There's a lot of awesome gear. We've been told that these jackets are great. Uh, <laughs> we've been modeling them, so you're welcome. Um, but, yeah, so buy whatever gear you want. Buy whatever gels, uh, nutrition. You know, there's a lot of things that are really awesome, and every year I buy something. But what we said to, as far as nothing new on race day is whatever you buy, whether it's something that you're going to ingest or something you're going to wear, leave it for after the race. There'll be many more days to train for other races, uh, many just days to run, but you want to get to the start line in almost a boring fashion, meaning 
you're wearing what's tried and tested. You've worn it several times during your buildup and your long runs. You know that this shirt fits well. It doesn't chafe. These shoes, socks, etc. And you already have your hydration and meal plan set. And that just doesn't necessarily mean on race day. That, that actually means today, tomorrow, tomorrow evening, uh, race day morning, like I know what I'm going to eat for breakfast, what I'm going to have for dinner, etc. So, you know, now it's not the time to experiment. New York City has a fantastic <laughs> number, a plethora of restaurants and, and eateries, but, you know, stick to what works. I know that many times some of our international runners actually bring, you know, their own pre-prepared meals because they know that this works for me and I'm not going to experiment. So avoid the race before the race and nothing new on race day. Stick to what has worked. It may be boring, but it will assure that you could focus on what you could control and don't worry too much about the rest. Yeah, and last but not least, runners, you've done all that. Time to start up. Do not go out too fast. You want to be in control. Take your time. Enjoy that view. The highest point of the first part of your race will be the Verrazon Arrows Bridge at mile one. It's an incline. You won't even feel it, but you definitely want to have that, uh, all, that um, all the energy you have. Keep that harnessed inside. Take your time. Chill out. Relax. If you're going to be running with one of our pacers, we're out there today. I have one of our pace signs. Uh, this has a 4.15 uh, uh, finish time with a pace per mile of 9.43. Uh, if you have not been to the expo yet, or maybe you have, maybe you stopped by, saw the Pacers, saw our coaches out there, talk to them a little about that. But yeah, if you're going to be out there, these, those Pacers will help you not go out too fast. You know, they run everything on an effort level basis. So if you're going up a hill, your pace may come back a little bit. As you go down, they may pick it up. But again, it's all about harnessing the energy. You've got 26.2 miles to go. Keep it in there. You know, keep it nicely in check. You don't want to go out too fast. So again, we have nothing new on on race day, avoid the race before the race, and do not go out too fast. Roberto, what else should our runners be prepared for? Um, the race, the race? They should be prepared for awesomeness. I know that doesn't sound like, <laughs> that doesn't, I know that doesn't Here sound, we go. yeah, I know it doesn't sound like a course strategy, but like awesomeness, because you know, the thing is, whether you're coming from another country, another state, another city, or just live here, most of us have primarily been training either alone or in small groups, but the TCS New York City Marathon, even this year, scaling it back, we're still at 30, 35,000 runners. That is still a tremendous amount of people. And then that's not even factoring the people out on the course. You know, Fourth Avenue, once you land into Brooklyn, wall to wall people, First Avenue here in Manhattan. So when I say awesomeness, it's just like you've done your long runs, you've done your training, you have not done anything that prepares you for the amount of support you're gonna see out there. It's the 50th running, we've been away for almost two years. Um, there's so much to celebrate. So prepare for that. And when I say awesomeness, I also mean like harness it, but don't let it push you. Because, you know, when we say don't go out too fast and, and you know, Coach Ben can show you the next slide, um, you'll see that there's a lot of people um, on the Verrazano's Bridge. You know, we all start, we're all super excited, we're all super pumped, but people try to go out as if they're trying to win the race in the first mile. And, you know, we always say you can't win the race in the first mile, but you can certainly lose it or at least make it a bit detrimental. So what you want to do in that first part on the Verrazano's Bridge is Go out nice and easy. Forget about what your goal race pace is. Just go on effort. Keeping that same effort, you're going to go down on the second mile of the Verrazano's Bridge, and you're actually going to just be flying. You're going to make up for that first mile. So the first two miles really just kind of nullify themselves. And then you get into Brooklyn. There you have a lovely shot of the Verrazano's Bridge. And, you know, you get into Brooklyn, and that's where you can start to settle into your pace. And that's the first time, other than, you know, maybe in the athlete's village where you're going to really feel the um, enormity of the race because those fans out there are just super stoked. Yeah, there you go. Enormity there's a shot for you right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a shot of what it'll look like. Uh, to a certain extent, it might be a little bit uh, less dense, but, you know, you have the crowd, the, the runners right there on either side of the bridge. They're going to de be deposited into Brooklyn on 4th Avenue, and that's where the crowd just really starts to pick you up. So really marshal your efforts, but honestly, prepare yourself for the awesomeness because it's from miles three till the end, crowds. It is a rolling awesomeness parade for sure. And that is right there. I mean, look at this guy over here. I'm going to circle this guy. I haven't seen this guy before. He is having a lot of fun. That right there, I think that just exemplifies awesomeness right there. That guy. He spotted feeling, the camera, that's for sure. <laughs> he spotted yeah. the camera. He knew where it was. He's feeling the awesomeness for sure out there, folks. So definitely, you know, enjoy that ride. Get out there. Because as Roberto said, after you come off the Verrazano and uh, uh, Harrow's Bridge, you will be coming into Brooklyn, miles three through seven. This is the area where you're just going to be settling into your pace. If you're with that pace team, they're just going to be cruising right out. Um, the course at this point is still kind of, you're in three different parts, as you see uh, right here 
I'll circle this for you right here. As you notice, when you come off the Verrazano uh, and Harrow's Bridge, the green, because you are on the lower level, you have a slight different pathway over to 4th Avenue um, than the rest of the crew. You all meet up around 78th or 79th Street on 4th Avenue uh, with the orange and blue. Um, if you do have people cheering for you out there on 4th Avenue, uh, let them know the green will be on the uh, east side or runner right, and orange and blue will be up on the west side uh, or up on runner left, so your loved one can find you appropriately on 4th Avenue as you cruise through uh, Brooklyn. But this is where you're kind of settling in, you're going through. And more importantly, as you approach um, mile eight, what happens at mile eight, Roberto? Mile eight, three courses become one. So as Coach Steve, uh, Steve. Steve, really? <laughs> as Coach Steve's friend Ben said, um, yeah, you have three courses, you know, orange, blue, um, um, orange, blue, green, and, and mile eight. <laughs> I can't. And mile eight, they all come together. Put some colors. Yeah. <laughs> and mile eight, they all come together. And the great thing about this is that for the first time, you know, you know, years past, I've run the course, and I always forget that there's like an extra wave out there, an extra color, and then you suddenly start to see them coming across from a different avenue, and they come across to Fourth Avenue, and that from there on out, um, and you know, you can see it on the next slide. The, the, all the runners run the exact same course. But the thing is, you know, if you're running the marathon for the first time, you're thinking, oh, I'm in orange wave or I'm in green wave, and, you know, which wave is the best? They're all equal. Every runner is going to run all 26.2 miles. And, of course, if your friends and family want to track you, which they should by downloading the app, they'll be, able to, they'll be able to know where you are on the course, what your projected finish time is. So once you get to mile eight, all three courses become one, but the thing is, it's still early days. Uh, over there on the screen, you can see on both sides of the of the road, there's aid stations. So if you need to grab uh, Gatorade water, I believe Gatorade comes first, and water, it's about almost a city block long, so don't feel like you need to have a bottleneck. Everybody needs to just get right there at the beginning of the aid station. You can kind of run up a little bit. That's a bit of a pro tip, but also still run easy. The marathon, as we've been saying all day today and yesterday, and we'll continue saying tomorrow, is super, super easy until it's not. Marathon pace, especially if you're really fit and, and you train well, should feel easy. You have adrenaline, you're tapered, you have the crowds. Again, all these factors that you haven't had in your training. So mile eight, you're going to feel like, this is, this is my day. Maybe I should pick up the pace. But you want to be very disciplined and stick to your plan. Obviously, if you're following one of our pacers, they're going to take care of that guesswork for you. But if you're running on your own, you know, don't get so caught up in the crowd that you let them pull you along. Let them pull you along later on in the course, right around mile eight. You still have a few miles to go to the 13 mile mark, the halfway point. So definitely marshal your efforts. Definitely, and it's very important. And also very important, you know, in this first part of the race, you wanna have that race plan, the strategy you have, your fueling plan in place. And some important notes here I put up on the screen, you'll see these are the different areas of the course where we will have hydration. As Roberto had pointed out earlier, uh, they're about a block long. You will have Gatorade first, you will have water second. Uh, but importantly, as you see here through the, the first part of the race, um, Right, right through here, you see there's a couple areas that don't have a gap. If I could draw better, it would be a whole lot better if I wouldn't get rid of everything. Sorry about that there, runners. But right here you have, you'll notice you have a couple of gaps here between miles 3 and 10. So miles 5, 7, and 9, there will not be water or, or Gatorade in that area. So plan yourself accordingly when you're going out with the hydration that you know that, okay, if I'm coming up on mile 4, mile 6, mile 8, maybe grab a little bit more water if you think you may need it because, again, you're going to have two miles until your next station. But don't worry, from mile 10 on, You'll have water and Gatorade at every mile, and more importantly, at miles 12 and mile 18, are, uh, you will be able to grab Honey Singer gels um, as you need. Again, going back to nothing new on race day, if you've been practicing with them, great. Uh, they'll be up there, out there for you to, to grab a few more. Uh, if not, then maybe stay away from them, or maybe grab an 18 if you need a little bit of a hit towards the end of the race. But definitely keep in mind, as Roberto pointed out, we come up on mile number 13. We have reached the halfway point from a measurement standpoint of the race. But more importantly, Roberto, what should runners be aiming for here when they get out there? So yeah, when you get to mile 13, it is a mathematical halfway point. But of course, like New York, for those of you who have not run it before, it's actually more challenging on the second half. So what that means is that as you go further along in the race, you're going to be naturally more fatigued, whether you're running a flat course, easy course, even downhill course. But of course, like New York, where there's still some significant climbs to go, in the second half is going to be more challenging. So just as I said, in mile eight, when all three courses come together, what you want to do is feel really good in mile eight. You also want to continue to feel good in mile 13. In, in all honesty, you could always make up for going out too slow or relatively speaking too slow, but you can't make up if you've gone out too fast. Bank equals bong. So try to get to mile 13 feeling really, really, really good because, again, you don't want to get to mile 13 kind of redlining because if you do that, 
chances are you're going to have a positive split. Positive split means that your second half of the course is actually slower than your first half. And then a negative split is means where your second half is faster. That means you've actually been able to pick it up. And then even split, which is more or less what our pacers are going to wear, are going to run, and we have one of them there on the screen in the lower right. Um, that just means that you're more or less even, you know, so that 415 marathoner is probably going to come through with our pace team around 207.30 or maybe even 208, knowing that they can make up for that in the, in the latter stages. So again, halfway point is the halfway point. Take a check. How am I feeling? It's still not too late to slow down if you've gone out a little bit quick, yeah. but try not to be going way too fast and thinking today's the day I'm just going to try to hold on because New York is not that sort of forgiving course, um, <laughs> and you want to make sure you have a, a, you know, a good day out there. Definitely, uh, Roberto. Great tips. Uh, runners, we're going to take a pause here at the halfway point. Take a little bit of a, a breather, as they say. You got to take, take, uh, take out a limb, harness the awesomeness, and take a few shout-outs and some questions as we, come, as we have started off our core strategy. We have Janera. Hello to everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for listening tonight. Brian, hi guys from Florida. If you could send some warmth our way after the marathon, we would appreciate that. Yeah, after the marathon, because I should believe it or not, especially for people coming from uh, Florida, we're actually going to have great weather, running weather for uh, on Sunday. So definitely, yeah. what would a core strategy be? Or we're Facebook Live with, I, with I, uh, Edgar. Excuse me, Edgar. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you so Edgar much. Edgar Bueno shout from Harlem. Hello. Always. Yeah. Pam, can't wait for the 2022 New York City Marathon. We're not even done with this one. People are already excited for the next Honestly, one. Honestly, I've heard of that from a few friends. And, you know, we can't wait as well, but let us get through this one first because <laughs> we're super excited about pulling this off. So, But we'll see you in 2022. And Manita, I wish everyone a great race. Thank you so much. There's a lot of excitement out there. Okay, we're, hey, we're going to go back to core strategy. Thank you so much. If you have any more shout-outs or questions, runners, drop them in there. I'm sure you have some questions out there, last-minute things you want us to kind of talk through. Uh, we are here on a rockin' Friday night in New York, so let us know what's going on. But let's jump back into the core strategy, and where have we entered in at this point, Roberto? We've entered our third borough of the day. So the TCS New York City Marathon is a five-borough race. We have Staten Island, where we begin. We have Brooklyn, where we just were, and now we're headed into Queens. Of course, the race will finish in Manhattan, but that's yet to come. We actually go in there twice. But we go into Queens via the Queensboro Bridge. Uh, actually, no, that's the Queensboro Bridge. That's how we get into Manhattan. So you got, <laughs> you, you got us there early. Uh, yeah, we take the Pulaski Bridge into uh, Queens. You know, we're there for a little bit over a mile, zig and zagging, and then we get onto the Queensboro Bridge, which for me is actually one of my favorite parts. It also is a part that I really mentally prepare for. And not because of like the solitude that you'll see in a, in a subsequent shot, but because it's a part of the course where you are beyond the halfway point, literally, but you're also somewhere in that you know twilight zone, Bermuda Triangle zone, at least for me mentally, where it's like, I'm still quite a distance away from the finish line. I, it, I can't quite feel like I'm being pulled to the finish line and I'm really far away from the start line. So I'm kind of that in-between zone where you know, even if I'm pacing really well, the enormity of the race starts to settle in. Um, and then as you can see here on the bridge, you're by yourself. There is the, this is the only part of the course where there's truly no spectators. And it's a, about a mile or so stretch on the Queensboro Bridge. And it's a long climb. So what you want to do there, take a moment to kind of gather your thoughts, think positively, know that even if you're tired, people around you are tired, all you hear is a pitter-patter of shoes, huffing and puffing. Um, if you're running again with one of our pacers, they'll be running up this hill, this bridge off of effort, not pace. So if you're running with our pacers, wonderful. And if you're running by yourself, it's okay to let your pace dip. Just know that you're is dipping because of the effort that you're putting in. Uh, and don't try to go up it too, too fast because you will be able to make up that distance if you focus on effort because of the backside of uh, Queensboro. Yeah, because definitely as you come up, you got what goes up must come down, as they say. And importantly, when you go down this bridge, you enter into the fourth borough of the race, which you do into enter Manhattan. Uh, this is an exciting part of the race. I mean, you've gone through 16 miles, you have 10 to go, and there is definitely a roar. Um, there is a, so much energy coming off this. First Avenue is waiting. They've been waiting all day. They cheer like no other as you come into Manhattan. Uh, you can see on the screen here, you see those green ponchos on the left and the right as the A stations that are there. And what this photo kind of does and kind of does not show is that this is a slight uphill as you are working through First Avenue. So even though you have that roar, you have this extent, this kind of surge of uh, surge to go up this you know, up on First, First Avenue, this is really important where you kind of want to keep everything settled in because you still have 10 miles to go. This is a stretch. As you make your way up First Avenue, the crowds will slowly dissipate as you make your way up into the 90s, the 100s, the 125s as you approach the best borough of the race in the Bronx. But before you get there, you've got about a 5K, a little more, three, almost four miles to roll through here. But take it easy. Again, the pace team will be settling in. They'll come off the bridge. 
This is where you want to make sure your fueling strategy is in play and working very well. You will hit mile 18 again. Honey Stinger will be there. There'll be, uh, there'll be different flavors, about four different, fla uh, four different flavors to use. There'll be one that will be caffeinated. The rest that will be not uh, will not be. You know, grab what you need. Uh, as we joked about earlier, maybe bring a shopping bag if you plan on grabbing a few of them out there. We're not touching that. We're not touching that one. Again, grab what you need because, uh, again, you want to have that last little bit going through. But again, I think we come up to one of Roberto's more challenging parts of the race, as he talked about before, as we come up into mile 21 and the Bronx. Yeah, so mile 2021, we're in the Bronx. Uh, we go over the Willis Avenue Bridge. It's a very relatively small bridge, I would say. Uh, myself and Coach Ben ran it through it uh, last Sunday, I believe, when we covered the last eight. And again, if you start the race at that point, you won't think much of these bridges, and you look at the elevation profile, you probably don't think much of it, but... The further you go into the race, the, long, the more uh, inclines are kind of accentuated, exaggerated, and you feel it. So 20 miles into the race, that's usually about like the threshold for most people's longest long runs. You know, some people run between 18 and 20 or 18 and 22. So you're kind of getting into that, um, relatively speaking, unknown territory. But, you know, you are the sum of your training. So don't think that just because you're hitting mile 20 or mile 21 in the Bronx that you have to hit this wall that a lot of us have heard about, the proverbial wall. What that just essentially means is when you have a, get to a point where you're really, really tired because of glycogen depletion, so you might start to feel weak. You might not even be breathing that hard, but what happens here is if you pace yourself really well, if you're listening to the advice that we're giving you, following the pacers accordingly, um, and really focusing on your hydration and nutrition, yeah. then you don't have to hit that wall. It's not mandatory. You might not even see it, you know, but you can still feel tired. So coming up the Willis, uh, Manis, Willis Avenue Bridge, what you're going to feel there is that incline. But again, just lean slightly forward into it, uh, run tall, and just go on effort because you're not in the Bronx for that long, but they definitely show you love because, um, as Coach Ben said, it's his favorite uh, borough. Um, I just always love running through there. Our group training coaches, shout out to them. They have a cheer station, so they'll be cheering out there for everybody. If you notice, actually, I was just looking at this picture again. There's three people in here that I just noticed that I thought were very interesting. This young woman right here, I mean, she has good form. Both feet are off the ground. I mean, she's feeling good on Willis Avenue. I've, I've not quite ever felt that feeling on this bridge before. I don't know if you have. Have you? Um, I mean, she's feeling good. I mean, look at that. I, I mean, she's well, the thing about the marathon, I've literally felt good there. And a mile <laughs> later, I felt completely different. <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing that we tell you, you know, if you've never run a marathon before, um, you might have experienced it in the long run. But it's wild how the marathon can be so easy and then it isn't. So, that's me right, right there. Like, yeah, I'm yeah. I mean, how I feel on this bridge usually. Yeah, like. <laughs> That, that could happen. So, you know, in order to avoid that, you want to focus on form, you want to stay upright, you want to be positive and know what bridges are coming, when they're coming, and then know that parts of the course are deceptively hilly, as we just covered in, um, along First Avenue. But, you know, on one side, you have somebody seemingly walking. On yeah. the other side, you have this gentleman having the time of his life. He's absolutely just crushing this. And look at that feeling of joy. He's just coming through. He's his cheer zone. He's hip his jerseys on. His club is right there. But anybody can get this joy and this excitement and this love. And the Bronx really does bring that as you come through. Because as Roberto said, 20 to 21, it's a tough challenge to go into. But again, you cross over the Madison Avenue Bridge and you are now back in Manhattan up here at Mile. Uh, you know, in this area here, you come back through. You'll be coming through. And more importantly, I want to kind of circle something right here. As you come back in, the bridge is going to be, you know, right about here, right below the 21 sign. But then more importantly, you've got this little kind of interesting place right there. It's called Marcus Garvey Park. It's on Fifth Avenue as you come back in. Most people think that, I mean, people get confused. They think that is Central Park. You see trees, you see a park, you think, wow, there's Central Park. I'm going to go for it. Pump the brakes. Hold on a second. That's Marcus Garvey Park. It's a beautiful park. Please visit that park. It is fantastic. It is a gorgeous area. But you will make a right, a couple of lefts, and a right back onto Fifth Avenue. Again, this is kind of where, if you have it, this is where the race is, could be on. If you watch the pros, usually by now, they are pushing themselves pretty good. They're definitely uh, in full tilt mode. And again, if you're following one of our pace teams, at this point, if you're feeling good, maybe pull away a little bit. If you're kind of right where you need to be, this is where you lean into that pace team, really have them guide you along. I was joking with someone earlier, you know, they are your tour guide through your 26.2 miles through all the five boroughs. Enjoy it. They will give you a great tour and take care of you all the way through. But Roberto, what does, after they cross through Marcus Garvey Park, what lies ahead? What lies ahead is a part that maybe if I was a spectator, I would enjoy. But as a runner, personally, uh, this is my most challenging part of the course is Fifth Avenue. So um, for those of you, again, out-of-towners, about 20 blocks, 20 New York City blocks equals a mile. So 
we are staying on Fifth Avenue, but we start entering Central Park area or territory around 110th Street. And we're going to be running on parallel to the park on Fifth Avenue for about a mile, gradual uphill, a mile around mile 22 or so of the course. It's just really lovely for, for most runners. So <laughs> you're running uphill for about a mile, 110th Street all the way to 90th Street where you enter the park. But this is the part where, again, people I coach personally, our group training runners, people I might be pacing, I say, let's make sure we get to this point feeling good because if we get to this point feeling good, to me, this is the last proper obstacle because after this, you enter the park, you know, you go through a series of downhills, but you're, you're within two plus miles of the race finish. So at this point, you're really running, starting to run more on heart. You know, like, again, I've been quoting Shalane the last couple of days. She said, run the first half with your legs, the second half with your heart. I say that last 5K or so, you know, or less than that, just coming into Central Park, that's where you can run on hard because, yeah, you still want to focus on pace. You still want to focus on form, you know, your hydration, whatever you may have left. But you really are so close to the finish that at this point, there's really no, not a lot much strategy in the sense of, like, am I really holding back? Like, yeah, if you're trying to go after a personal best, you're starting to look at your watch a little bit more, like, I need to make sure my pace doesn't dip. But all that comes before if you can really make it up Fifth Avenue well and good because it is a tough climb, and that's where a lot of people's personal best might go out the window. So again, feel good at mile eight, dynamite. Feel good at mile 13, great. Feel good at mile 20 or get to mile 20, between mile 20 and right here on Fifth Avenue. That's where the race really occurs, both for the elites and for um, you know our citizen runners. Absolutely, because you come in at East 90th Street, back into the park, you have a scant 2.2 miles to go. And like anybody can do 2.2 miles. Yes, it is the end of the marathon. Yes, you will be feeling that fatigue. But again, everyone, you, if you watched the broadcast before, you know the announcers are always quick to say, oh, the hills of Central Park. Yes, there are hills in Central Park, but thankfully you get to avoid the, the biggest ones or the majority of them. And the ones you do get to encounter, you will be actually running downhill. So as you come into the park, you will be on East Drive, you will go behind the Met, uh, and then you'll be going down what is actually called here in New York City called Cat Hill. There's a statue on the hill of a crouching panther it's a mountain lion. Is it a mountain lion? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely not a house cat. It's, it's massive. A, it's a house cat. It's the biggest house cat I've yeah, ever seen. Yeah, yeah. But you'll go down. It's about a quarter mile of a hill. Yeah, and at this point, you know, again, downhill may not feel fantastic. You may want to roll down it instead, but we recommend that you do keep your feet and get down that hill as safely as you can. You go past the boathouse, a small little uh, kick, uh, kicker hill as you come around, and then you'll be coming down through mile 25 as you exit Central Park behind the Central Park Zoo on to Central Park South. And at this point, you've got about a mile and change left to go. That is, uh, this is the view you actually will have as you come on to Central Park South, looking into Columbus Circle. And as you know, this morning, Coach Steve, I thought, did a very good job. He said, you know, this is, this is the statue right there. This is I have drawn a lasso around him. You know, you know, try to throw your own metaphorical lasso around old Christopher Columbus and, have, and just pull your way up because it is a slight incline. The picture does not quite show it, but similar to First Avenue, it's just enough to go through. But again, after they hit Columbus Circle, they make the right hand to Roberto. They are in Central Park. And what lies in front of them? Uh, about 400 plus meters, just under 500 meters of gradual incline. But again, at this point, no hill matters because you're coming in to finish. This is our 2019 uh, champion, our both male and, and female champion. Uh, and what you want to do here, you're just running all out. You know, you're running on, on heart. You're just trying to get to the finish line as quickly as you can, uh, and it, it is a gradual incline. A lot of you who are watching this, if you're going to be running it, chances are you have maybe already visited this portion of the course uh, yesterday, maybe today, or maybe tomorrow. So at this point, it doesn't really matter how much of an incline, but what you want to do is come across the finish line like these winners are doing. You know, obviously they've won, so they're super excited, but one thing they're not doing, and they do care about their time because they have time bonuses and things like that. None of them are running as they cross the finish line, looking at their watch, looking down. They're crossing the finish line. Maybe they'll click it afterwards. You could do the same thing because we have professional timing. Everybody will be timed. You'll what? be tracked. Yeah, yeah. You this year? Exclusive. <laughs> uh, we have professional timing. And of course, you know, you obviously want to upload it to your social uh, media devices, Strava, things like that, trackers. But sacrifice a couple of seconds here and there just so you could get a fantastic finisher uh, photo because I've been at the finish line uh, a couple of times today is awesome and it's just like it looks great for the fit for the winners but it's relatively empty but this is what it is it's like theater of humanity just people coming through celebrating goals of a lifetime dreams um you know people have been training for weeks months years some people this is like their bucket list and you could be amongst those so cross the finish line celebrate and but then you know the race 
ends there, but then we have what we call the 27th mile, Ben. It is the 27th mile. You, you've done all that work. You, you, as you cross the finish line, like Roberto had touched on before, we do want to get you uh, get that mask back on. I'm sure you'll be trying to grasp, uh, gasp a little bit of air in, get some breath in. But um, as you're handed your recovery bag, and you will be handed your medal as well, inside the recovery bag presented by the hospital for special sur uh, surgery, there will be a surgical mask in, in there. Uh, please try to get that mask on at a somewhat of a good pace as you go through. Uh, that way you have your face coverings because you will be breathing very heavy at that point. Again, for safety, you want everyone to have face covered at that point. But in that bag, more importantly, it will be a plethora of things to choose from to help aid in your recovery. It will be difficult. You may not feel like eating or drinking anything, but there will be Gatorade, pulling water, uh, uh, pretzels. Honey Singer will have a different kind of protein bar or wafers if they have the waffles in there. Definitely eat that. The waffles are my favorite. There'll be an apple in there as well and some other assorted goodies for you, but try to start drinking a little bit. Even if you can't eat, just drink some of the Gatorade, have some water. Recovery begins the minute that you cross that finish line at mile 27. And more importantly, keep moving. It'll be so, you'll feel so good to sit down, but the minute you sit down trying to get back up, will feel like the Tin Man with no oil. You're definitely going to sit down. You're not going to want to get back up. Um, if people try to help you up, your legs will be stiff. They will be sore. So just keep on walking through. Um, you know, as you cross through, there will be a timing mat actually to let your loved ones who are tracking you on the app, well, they will know when you cross through um, and you're out onto Central Park West. And you'll be feeling like this gentleman here who is just feeling great. And you've made your post your post race plans and Roberto, if they've made their post race plans, what can they expect next? Um, they can expect to be, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. they can expect to reunite with their friends well, and, that's and family. Thing, yeah, it's amazing. How yeah, that works. and the reason we mentioned that, you know, we've been tracking on the app and making post race plans tonight. If you haven't already done it, and I, the latest tomorrow is because with thirty five plus thousand finishers, there's sometimes cell phone saturation because we just talk about the number of participants, but we don't even talk about the number of people around the city, around the finish line area. Everybody's got a smartphone uploading photos, sending messages. So your battery might die because you've just run with your phone for 26.2 miles, um, or you might not have cell phone reception. You know, it's not a given, of course. So make sure you have plans. As Coach uh, Ben just said, when you cross that line, the finish line, and another line, you're gonna, your loved one's tracking, you're going to say, uh, Ben just finished, and he's just now past the finish line, so they can start to know when they can expect it. Because as you can see over here, the area in blue is the frozen zone, so that's only for our finishers. And you're going to be kind of marshaled in slowly with your goodie bag, your poncho, your awesome medal that somebody asked us about earlier today. It does look good. Oh, yeah. um, and then you're going to be exiting on the west side of uh, Central Park on West 72nd Street. So after that, obviously, where you go, whether it's this restaurant, this eatery, uh, bar, whatever, um, it's up to you, but make sure you have that plan set in place tonight at the latest tomorrow because you will be tired but you have to get yourself to your loved ones to celebrate the awesome race that you just had because you listened to our core strategy <laughs> definitely if you listen to that this is easy i mean this is easy now 26.2 miles we've laid it out for you perfectly you know again runners you've done all the training at this point um really this is a friday night any running you've done maybe tomorrow if you want to go out and shake out a little bit great if not get off your feet Take it easy. This is the core strategy up there. But I know we've got some more shout outs. We have some more questions that are coming through. So let's check it out. See who's out there giving us some props. Sabine, nervous and excited. Nervous and excited is good. I mean, to me, that shows you care. You're kind of ready for it. I think I know Sabine. Uh, Sabine coming out from New Jersey. Let me know. But I might know <laughs> Sabine. But ex yeah, the nervous and excited is normal. Harness that. Just don't let it consume you and focus on the training that you've done to get here and hyper focus on those long runs and good workouts you had. Those are the ones that we really need to live by uh, in order to get us to the start line and finish line. Yeah, and the, that's the important part. And we have some questions coming in. Thank you so much, runners. Here's our first question up here. Uh, okay, Roberto. Uh, Misa or Mesa, I hope I got that correct. Any good suggestion for a walk run strategy? Yeah, I mean, everybody's different. I, I've definitely coached some runners to walk run or run walk. So I would just say, go by minutes um, versus miles. So, you know, when you start from, uh, you know, when you start in Verrazano and Arrows Bridge, maybe you start running a little bit just because people are going to be kind of taken off the line, but say, okay, I'm going to run for X amount of minutes and I'm going to walk for X amount of minutes. And you just keep going back and forth and you might do that. And you might say, I'm going to do that till I get to 5K and then I'm going to kind of change the ratio. And the reason I'm being purposely vague on specifics is because everybody's different. If I knew you a little bit better, I'd say, okay, run for three minutes, walk for one, or run for three minutes, walk for two, 
or what have you, and that's just obviously maybe a four minute increment, total that we're talking about, or five in a minute increment, but have that plan set, and you'll know best what works for you, and then just alternate, just run for this amount of minutes, walk for this amount of minutes, and you keep doing that, and the thing is like, while you're doing that, you'll find that not only are you being maybe more efficient because you know what your current fitness is or limitations are, but eventually you will be passing people even doing that because some people will go out like, um, you know, Wiley Coyote uh, chasing the roadrunner and eventually beep, beep, they hit that wall and now wall. they're walking wall. and they're not walking because they set out to have that plan. They're walking because the body has said no. So, but yeah, run walk is quite common, quite popular. Um, but how you break it down, that's up to you. Yeah, I, mean, I give a shout out to one of our uh, coach we have, Coach Josh. He actually ran walk a half marathon a few years ago and did phenomenal. I mean, super quick. Josh Wessler? Yeah, Josh Wessler did a run walk in uh, Central Park. I think it may have been the Fred LeBeau half. Uh, talk to him later. Again, it's the run walk people look at as kind of a weird thing. I mean, I know there's, um, uh, who's the run walk uh, coach that uh, came up with the plan? His name escapes me. Galloway? Yeah, the guy, I mean, there is a plan yeah. out there. I mean, it's a very effective tool and a very effective plan, and it can be used at all ability levels. Uh, so keep it up, runners. But we've got some more questions, so we'll keep on rolling. But great, good luck. We have Sue. I have a gluten allergy. Is there anything gluten-free in the finish line bag? Uh, water. Yeah, the apple, the apple for sure. The apple for sure. I don't know if the honey singer from uh, uh, pro, uh, pro protein bar is gluten-free or not, but the apple will be for sure. Yeah, I know that uh, the honey singer is organic and they use nothing but natural products. But like, I'm not sure about gluten, yeah. but. Yeah, I would just say um, take a look before you consume yeah. it. But the apple um, would certainly be um, you water, know, water uh, and beyond that, I mean, sometimes the the waffle potentially. The waffle potentially, but I think again, I mean, you may not be super um, uh, hungry when you come across the apple. Maybe enough to at least get you through the finish area to get some some you know, some you know you know and some more information. And then you know another good thing is you know if you're not sure about what is uh, gluten free for a uh, honey singer, go to Honeysinger.com. Uh, check out what is on there. To kind of, they do have some vegan, like maybe some stuff on there. Maybe some, yeah. uh, maybe some gluten-free. I know they're very good about their organic stuff. Check out what's on there. So that way, at least you know. Uh, so that way, when you get your bag, if that item is in there, well, there you go. You have something more to eat. But uh, the apple should be good. The water uh, get you through your loved ones. You maybe hopefully have more recovery for you. Yeah. Next, check uh, Jacqueline. What is the best strategy clothing-wise when the sun goes down? Leather pants? I don't know. <laughs> no. What? No, I'm not, no. <laughs> Leather pants. Well, you never really got to be warm, yeah. you know? <laughs> no. Um, you know, I, I would say we, we, we've been saying it for the last couple of days, layers. Layers is yeah. the best thing because if you have layers, you could always take them off and put them on. But if you don't have enough layers, you can never put something on later on if you're cold. So the one thing I will say before I continue answering that question is regardless of what you end up wearing, how many layers, make sure that your bib is on the most inner layer, the one layer that you definitely won't take off because if you're taking off layers, putting them on, you could potentially displace your bib or even toss it. But I would say the best strategy is maybe if, if you're thinking you're going to be running, and we had a few people mention that to us uh, yesterday, sun will be going down around 4.45 because it's daylight savings time tomorrow night when we go to bed. I would say start out with layers, and you could take them off throughout the day, you know, tie a long sleeve or maybe a half zip or something around your waist. And then later on in the day, as you continue to run, if you start to feel a little bit chilly, you put it back on, and the thing is that if you've tied it around your waist, chances are it's going to remain fairly dry, which will feel really good if you're starting to get a little chilled as you put it back on. But layers is the way to go, whether it's arm warmers, a half zip, you know, make sure that it's something, this sort of technical material that's going to keep you warm, break the wind, but also kind of moist, uh, wick the moisture away because, you know, despite of how awesome the temperature is meant to be for running, even in the low mid 40s and, and, and low 50s or even to mid 50s, you're gonna be breaking a sweat at some point, and once you break a sweat, you're losing nutrients, but you're also needing to displace that um, that sweat, otherwise it's gonna stay on you if you're wearing you know, um, cotton t-shirts and things like that. Spot on, perfect. Next question coming at us. We got Mike, will I be able to access the BC on 72nd Street, Central Park West, or is it going to be blocked off? Um, I, I believe that they will be able to. Yeah, um, yeah I know. I, right. I, yeah, it's, it's right off the walk-off, but um, yeah. I would say definitely check the MTA line, but when you walk off, you would be able to right there. Yeah, access it because it, it will be there. Um, there might be barricades because it's still closing off to the frozen zone. Um, I know in 2019, I actually lived not far from there in the Upper West Side, and I was able to 
walk off and I think I went down on 68th and then I was able to go as far west as I needed to. Um, but yeah, you could have come up on the other side of the barricade. You might just have to go down a little bit, um, basically essentially to Columbus Circle. Right. So if you're looking to access the BC line 72nd and Columbus Circle aren't that far apart, you're actually kind of walking that direction yeah. anyway. Perfect. Next question coming at us. Bella. Where can private vehicles drop off runners at the Runner's Village in Staten Island? We left on School Road. Okay, at, I, I was corrected, at La Ponde Ave and McLean. Uh, just make sure you give yourself time because I don't know how close you're going to be able to get to the Star Village area to, for, to hop off. There will be buses that, that will be coming from um, uh, Staten Island Ferry. Yeah, yeah, Staten Island Ferry. And the bridge does close at 630. Um, so if you're coming from, you know, from the Brooklyn area over the Verrazano, it's 6.30, that bridge will close. If you're going to be on Staten Island, make sure you give yourself time to get over there. You still will have to walk over, get through security. Uh, so just don't think that because you're getting dropped off, you can sleep in an extra two hours, as good as that might feel. Avoid the race before the race. Yeah, yeah. It's a good idea and nothing new on race day for sure, even if that car does feel good. But yeah, give yourself some time there and we'll see you in Fort Wadsworth. Okay, Jeff, what time should I uh, be at the TFK ferry on Sunday morning? It says 6.30. Roberto, I, think it's, I believe that answered the question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, again, I mean, their, their idea is to give you, you know, your transportation time is designed to get you to Staten Island in enough time to not only get there, uh, but find the wave in your corral area and give you time to sit down and relax. Again, don't race before the race. Uh, maybe, I don't know if you're in wave one, you know, that's a, a 9.10 start or 9.55 in the second wave. Um, you know, don't want to push it too far. Uh, so, again, take the transportation that's been assigned. Uh, get yourself there with plenty of time to sit down, maybe top off the fuel with a little bit of a, you know, a snack before you go, and then get in your corral, and away you go. Yeah. And here we go. And we'll wrap it up with Terry. Now that the fifth wave has been added, is the sweep later? I never had to worry about that, but now I'm a bit nervous. Uh, yeah, I believe this year is uh, six and a half hours. Uh, in, in previous years, is about six hours, which is a 13 minute and 44 second uh, per mile pace. So what that'll mean this year, whether it's six and a half hours or in pre prior years, six hours, is that means that that's once the very last finisher starts. So obviously in different waves and corrals, we all go, but if myself and Ben are in the same wave, he might be um, up ahead and I might be further behind. So we might even have two minutes between us. So as soon as I cross the line, being the one behind the two of us, that's when that sweet bus or that clock essentially begins. So I would say if, if you have experience running our marathon and, and you have experience, you know, running just off the sweet bus, it'll be more or less the same thing, except for, you have, you know, you're getting an extra half hour, assuming you are literally the one who starts at the very end. If you start a little bit before that, it might be 35 minutes, 40 minutes, depending on, on where you start in, in your wave and corral. Spot on, perfect. Well, runners, thank you so much. Roberto, we made it through another course strategy. Thank sure you. Did. No KT tape questions. We were looking forward to those this time. We skated through that one good. Live runners, and learn. thank you so much. We will be back again tomorrow morning, uh, 9 a.m., 12 p.m., 6 p.m. Eastern Standard. No, we're still be daylight time, won't we? Standard time. Yeah. Sunday, we're still daylight time. So, we but 9, bed. noon, and 6 here out on the East Coast uh, with three more course strategies coming at you. Bring those questions, bring those shout outs calm those a final bit of nerves if not we will see you at the expo either later tonight or tomorrow good luck we'll see you at the start line take care